Our text this morning is the, the text that has served as our theme verse for this, uh, this academic year from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 to 58. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, our theme text that has uh, guided us through this academic year comes at the very end of 1 Corinthians 15. That's the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. And although the chapter is a consummate Easter chapter, and while I've spoken on this same text many times this year, Today is the first time that the theme verse finally coincides with the Easter season. With that in mind, I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is risen, that the tomb is empty, and that God has raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, however, is not a true historic fact just because I say so. My saying so doesn't make it so. At the same time, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is not an untrue historic deception just because somebody else might say that it never occurred. Someone's rejection of the, the gospel account doesn't determine whether or not it actually happened. Speaking of the gospel account, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is not a true historic fact just because Matthew or Mark or Luke or John or Paul in our text say that it happened and that they witnessed the risen Lord Jesus with their own eyes, or we might believe it because they wrote it, we trust them as reliable witnesses, or because we believe that God's word is true and does not lie. But the resurrection truly happened whether they said so and wrote about it for posterity or did not. Or conversely, the resurrection did not happen just because they wrote about it claiming to be eyewitnesses. Either way, it happened or it didn't happen. And either way, the scriptural account is either true or it's untrue. And finally, the fact that you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross to remove the guilt of your sin and that on the third day he rose again from the dead to give you the promise of everlasting life, just because you believe it's true, that doesn't make it true. Or you might say it's true for you even if somebody else disagrees, but what is true for you is not true at all if Jesus, in fact, is not raised from the dead. And likewise, an unbeliever cannot say, well, what's true for you is not true for me, and thereby cause it somehow to be that way. Just because he or she doesn't believe that Jesus is raised from the grave does not nullify the resurrection if it actually happens. Are you with me? It all boils down to this. Either Jesus is raised from the dead or he's not. For a moment, let's consider implications. So I'm here to tell you that Christ has burst forth from death's strong bands, that the tomb could not hold him, that he is alive, that you are forgiven, that heaven's gates are open wide. And this I believe with my whole heart, moments of weakness to the contrary notwithstanding, because the Bible says it's so, and because for generations the faithful have raised the strain of triumphant gladness. But consider for a moment, the whole thing has just been a pious fraud, as some say, a, a false witness, an opiate for the people, a drug to delude us, to numb our senses and reason, and to manufacture some kind of meaning out of an otherwise meaningless existence. Actually, the Apostle Paul himself considers such implication in words just before our text. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, 
and you are still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Pity us for wasting so much time and energy on a faith that is false if Jesus is not raised from the dead. Indeed, pity us for wasting our whole lives for following some far-fetched fairy tale if Jesus is not raised. Of all people, we are most pitiful if, as some say, and maybe even as most say, the resurrection never happens. Those are the implications, I guess. If the resurrection is not true, there might be others. But we would have lived our lives in a fog pretending we know where we're going when, in fact, we've had no clue. And when we die, I realize it's been kind of heavy so far, so I'm going to break it up with a little story here, just a little interlude. I want you to go back to, to Labor Day weekend. It seems like you know, just a few days ago in a way, right? School was just starting. We had this long weekend break already early in September. It was the Saturday of Labor Day weekend, and I was headed downstairs for breakfast. My mind was on the 5K race that we were hosting for the Lutheran High School students who were here on campus. And before the team events, there was scheduled an open race for the, the coaches, the parents, old people like me. So I was thinking about breakfast and what, what to eat, what not to eat on the morning of a race. And there on the kitchen counter, there was coffee from Starbucks for the family. My daughter Hannah, she went out early to get some for everybody. Not for me, I don't drink coffee, but anyway. She wrote a little message in chalk on a board right next to the coffee that read, Labor Day, mid-April 2017, something along those lines. First, I didn't pay any attention, figuring that the chalkboard had something to do with the Starbucks people, but not me. But she said, did you read the message? I looked a little closer, but, but I was confused. I mean, this was Labor Day weekend. What did April have to do with Labor Day? And then by her little smile, I figured it out. She was announcing that in April, she would be experiencing her own Labor Day. She was announcing that, that she was going to have another baby, her second, and, and our second grandchild. And just like the first time when they told us about Ava, just like the first time I wept for joy. Well, Hannah's April 17 due date came and went, and she watched with envy, along with many others, as April, the pregnant giraffe, finally gave birth to a, before a worldwide audience. <laughs> Hannah was impatient. She waited for her own labor to begin. She was eager to have this baby, but evidently the baby was in no big hurry to be delivered, and so alas, Labor Day, mid-April 2017, as it turns out, was actually April 25th. And then Jonah, Tad, Meineke was welcomed to the world. Baby, however, was not thrilled to leave the womb behind. In fact, labor had to be induced to accelerate the process. But I want you to put yourself in the position of my grandson. Not the fetal position, I'm just speaking metaphorically here. Okay. The womb, though, the womb was the only world that the baby ever knew. It was home to him since before Labor Day. And now this other Labor Day, April 25th, encroached upon the only world that, that he had ever known. And up until the end, it was a comfortable enough place for Jonah, if not for Hannah. But he was warm, safe, nourished. The voices from beyond perhaps signaled something other on the outside, but the baby approached that unknown future with fear and with uncertainty, and he passed from the womb to the world, kicking and screaming, I'm told, just like babies so often do. Put yourself in the position of the grandfather. When I think about that baby, preferring to linger longer in the womb, well, I felt a little amused. In September, I wept for joy. 
But now I just smiled. I mean, the baby was in a dark and foggy place. This is so much better. So much more to do, places to go, people to meet, things to see. And I guaranteed that it was so much better here. I personally offered him those assurances. Mine was one of the voices that the baby heard from the great beyond, but which he was unable fully to understand or appreciate. And no matter what I said, and no matter how much I I coaxed and cajoled. The baby just didn't know for sure what was outside of the womb. He didn't know what to expect. Pardon that personal reflection. Where did I leave off? Oh, yes. And when we die, when we leave behind the womb of this world, the only world that we've ever really known, what are we to expect? There have been voices. We've heard them. We've read them. We have some idea of what they're trying to communicate. They promise us that what awaits us is exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond anything we could ever ask for or imagine. But we still wonder and we worry and we're a little afraid. And we leave the the womb of the world kicking and screaming fighting to the last breath the same way that we fought against our first one. What if it's not true? The father smiles upon his children as he waits to welcome us and to show us the full extent of what he has promised. And in his nearer presence, unobstructed by womb or tomb, sin or death, the words we have heard are fulfilled. And in the twinkling of an eye, it will all be changed. I tell you a mystery, we will all be changed from the perishable to the imperishable. And in that moment, in that moment, we will immediately wonder, what were we so afraid of? Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It won't hurt anymore. And the wounds that this world inflicts upon us have already been borne by the wounds of the one who has finally and fully and forever healed us. His victory is our victory. And because Jesus is raised from the dead, death will not hold us either. And the light trouble of this moment, whatever form or or shape it assumes in the womb of the world, is just preparing us for that everlasting weight of glory. I've never heard Concordia described as a womb. Once in a while, I hear it referred to as a bubble. (laughs) Recently, our our campus was recognized as the safest in the state of Wisconsin. That's really, I think, a very good thing. But some of you perhaps cannot wait to get out of here, (laughs) get on with your summer vacation or to the rest of your life. Others, though, may have found this to be such a comfortable place that you never want to leave. As far as the future goes, none of us knows for sure what to expect. But whether we stay or we go, the Apostles' encouragement to us to be steadfast in our service, or as we say here at Concordia in our mission statement, service to Christ in the church and the world, that is our way. That is our way of witnessing to the world that we believe. The side of glory we sometimes struggle to understand or even believe. The voices from beyond, they, they give us that extraordinary promise. But this is the only world we've ever known. And now we see through this glass dimly. We peer through a fog. But one day we will see face to face. We will see Jesus. And he'll be smiling, waiting to hold us in his arms. And when faith gives way to sight and we see with our own eyes we will realize that the gospel voice was telling us the truth. The victory of Jesus over sin and the grave is not his alone. He gives it to us. He gives it to you. It is yours and you are his forever. In Jesus' name, amen.